Welcome back to Advanced Hard Chemistry, guys. Pay no attention to the blue thing. Sorry, I'm filming in a strange location. I don't have my normal camera mount. Today, I'd like to look at SN1 reactions versus SN2. I'd like to have a look at what substitution reactions are. I'd like to have a look at the mechanisms behind these two approaches. Why does one happen compared to the other? And I need to look. At, I'd like to look, even sorry, at the consequences of um, the reaction style on the rate equation and also the stereochemistry of the product that you make. We are going to start today with purple. We're going to start with SN2. Uh, once I get myself a piece of paper. Amateur hour here. Sorry about that. So, um, well, I'm starting with SN2 because it's probably slightly easier. Uh, in terms of understanding what's going on behind it. First of all, this is a substitution reaction. So if we have, for example, chloromethane, start with something nice and simple. Substitution means we're going to pull this chlorine off and substitute something else for it. I think the thing that we should substitute is a, a hydroxide ion at the moment. So uh, if we do this reaction, we're going to make methanol, and we're going to make a free uh, chloride ion. Don't shout at me, by the way. I know you can't have that by itself. There is a counter ion, but it's purely a spectator, sodium, or whatever you like. So we're not going to put it in. Um, so this is my substitution reaction. It involves a nucleophiles, which is why there's an N there. A nucleophile, of course, is something that's attracted to a positive charge. In our case, it's this hydroxide ion. Um, so how does this reaction work? Well, what's happening here is that we have a slightly polarised carbon-chlorine bond. This is ever so slightly delta minus, and this is delta plus, and this pair of electrons are a little bit towards the chlorine. Um, so what can happen is that when the presence of this HO minus, this hydroxide ion, can polarise that bond even further, and you can start to do the curly arrow thing. Quick recap in curly arrows, although you might want to watch the other video on it for clarity. The curly arrows show where a pair of electrons currently are and where they're going to go. So, um, this pair of electrons is currently the charge, and they are going to go into the middle of space here. Some people draw it towards the carbon atom. I draw it here because the bond is going to form here. Um, and this pair of electrons that are currently here, they are going to depart, and they're going to go into there. Um, and then you make this. The SQA wants you to know that this is done in a single step. Um, there is an intermediate that I'm going to come back to because you're required to know the structure of this. The two, guys, what's the significance of the two? It means there are one and two chemicals involved in the rate determining step because there is only one step. Therefore, this is the rate determining step and it contains the hydroxide and the chloromethane. Now, that means that the rate equation for this particular reaction will look, uh, if I can write A's correctly, I've forgotten how to write after lockdown, K, okay. and concentration of hydroxide times the concentration of the chloromethane. So there are two things involved in the rate equation or the rate determining step, um, and that's why the two's there. What does this uh, intermediate look like? This is the world's scruffiest purple pen. What is going on with that? Um, the intermediate uh, looks like this. It's a transition state. And if you have a quick look here, you'll find that I'm implying there are five bonds onto this carbon. This one is here is forming just as this one is breaking. Remember the activity complexes from higher? That's the sort of idea here. It does have a particular shape, though. It's got five bonds to a carbon, and it's got five pairs of electrons. So when you have five pairs in all are bonded, then that is a trigonal bipyramidal. In other words, um, you've got something in the center here. You've got an equatorial bond. You've got one disappearing here. These are all equatorial bonds, one coming out of the page and one in the plane of the paper. So this is meant to look like a trigonal bipyramid. My apologies for my terrible drawing. Um, so it's two triangular-based pyramids stuck together. That is really terrible, actually. I've done much better than that in the past. Let's draw what it would probably look like. Now, I'm going to draw the simple version here so we don't confuse things too much. Let's keep the chlorine here. Let's keep a hydrogen here, hydrogen here. Um, let's have our hydroxide ion there. 
and let's have the last hydrogen here. So this is our transition state. I'll stick a square bracket around about it. And if you look at here, there is a 1 minus and a 0 charge, and here is 0 and 1 minus. So that means there's a running charge of 1 minus through this whole reaction. You can't just have it disappearing. There was a time a few years back when they were very keen that you did this, so therefore we'll stick the negative charge just outside the brackets. It's on the whole thing. Um, and that's us done, basically. So um, one step, two things involved in a determining step. Your transition state is a trigonal bipyramid, um, and then it's a substitution reaction. Just before we leave, the more realistic way of drawing this would be this, actually. I think the hydrogens should be on all the equatorial positions. And I wonder if you could tell me why. So we'd probably have the chlorine here, and have the hydroxide on the other axial position. So there's a reason I've put the hydrogens onto the equator and these guys here on the tops. I wonder if you could work out what that is. Um, if you can't work out what it is, I'm just about to tell you, of course. Spoiler alert. It's simply because of physical size. Chlorine and hydroxide are massive in comparison with these wee three protons, so they will get pushed as far away from each other as possible to give 180 degrees between them, <clears throat> as opposed to 120 degrees on the equator. Let's have a quick look at SN1 reactions now. Again, substitution nucleophilic. This time, there's only one thing involved in the rate uh, determining step. Now, here is a classic uh, SN1 reaction. That's so supposed to be to the carbon, I apologize. Now, we are going to react it with hydroxide, just like before. Apparently. And apparently, just like before, we make an alcohol. We make 2-methylpropan-2-ol, if you want to be precise. Um, now, how is this reaction different? Why is there only a 1 here? Now, if you remember what happened last time, this hydroxide, I wrote it over here because it came into attack from the opposite side that the chlorine was on. Because <coughs> that's what happens in reality. <coughs> I apologise, coughing your ear. Um, that cannot happen this time, because these three relatively bulky methyl groups are in the way. This is called steric hindrance. Now, this means that this mechanism here is seriously different to the last time. What's going to happen here is you're going to get a curly arrow like that, and then we're going to form a carbocation intermediate. Now, I should try and draw this correctly. So let's see if I can get it right. And this carbocation has a positive charge on it. Now, this is planar. It's flat. There's 120 degrees between these, but it is completely flat. So that's stage one. Stage two is that the hydroxide, which had been patiently tapping its toes, by the way, I should write, of course, that is the slow step. So that is the rate determining step. And as you can see, this does not play a part, we only have this playing a part, so we need to wait until this has ionised, and now we can do the second stage, which is the fast stage. Um, and we're going to have, sorry, I forgot my charge, we're going to have that, I'm racing against the clock here before the bell rings, now that we're back in work again, and now this is going to come in and attack here, or of course it could come in and attack here. That is a choice. Um, now, that's going to have a consequence on the stereochemistry of the product, but let's come back to that uh, later on. Uh, let's have a look at what we've got here. So, slow RDS. This is the only thing that's involved in the right equation. Therefore, the right equation looks like this. Equals K and the concentration of the trimethyl uh, and chloride ion. That's it. Hydroxide is not involved. That's why it's one. There's only one thing involved in the determining step. Um, fine. Can we go back to our original learning outcomes then? And we'll have a look at what I wanted to have a look at last, which was, I, I think we've done substitution, done the mechanism. Oh, why? 
Why does this happen yet? Yeah, sorry, silly old fool. There are two reasons that this happens. Uh, one versus two. Number one <clears throat> was that steric hindrance caused by the relatively bulky hindrance. I'm never quite sure about that word. Steric hindrance. In other words, the methyl groups are getting in the way of this. It can't come in and attack. And the second reason that this can manage to be formed this time, whereas it wasn't last time, is because <coughs> there are six and three, there are nine electrons here, so 27 electrons round about this. These electrons can contribute some of their presence to that center carbocation, and they can stabilize the carbocation's existence. So this effectively gets cut down from a whole one plus, which, as you can imagine, it's not very happy being, down to less than that. So that means you will form a, a reduced charge, and that is called inductive stabilization. Cracking words, hey, stabilization. So inductive stabilization of the carbocation intermediate. That's the second reason that this can happen. Back at this one. This could easily attack, and there was no way that carbon was going to survive as a plus charge, so it just, boom, it just happens in one stage. Whereas this happens in a two-stage reaction. You form this, and then you attack with the OH-. So that's the reasons why. <clears throat> Consequences on stereochemistry. Well, if you have an SN... Uh, if you started with an optically active molecule, for example, CH3... And then we had the chlorine, and we had something weird like OH here, and then something different again, like C2H5, something like that. One, two, three, four. These are four different groups, so this is a chiral carbon. If you do SN1, uh, the intermediate uh, is not flat. The intermediate contains... A, a, sorry, the intermediate carries on its three-dimensional structure. So if you start with a single enantiomer, so a single hand of this, single enantiomer, go and look at my video on stereochemistry, you'll find you only make a single hand, single enantiomer, of the product, which is great for medicines, because medicines are affected by a chiral environment, you know, the inside the body. Um, uh, that, oh, I can't have OH for that. Sorry. Oh, sloppy. Let's have an SH. Let's have a thiol group instead. There we go. Four different things on there, four different things on there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, if you did an SN2 reaction with it, if the mechanism was SN2, then because your intermediate is flat, then by the law of large numbers, more or less equal numbers of hydroxide will attack from this side as from this side onto it. So you get pretty much a 50-50, in other words, a racemic mixture of your products, which, as I said, is bad news. Uh, for medicines and for a variety of other things, but sp specifically for medicines. So that's the consequence of stereochemistry. SN1 reactions retain the optical activity. SN2 reactions, because of that flat intermediate, it's two-dimensional only, you lose the optical activity. I, I should have said at the start, by the way, SQA pages 88 and 89. It sounds like relatively simple, but as you can see, there's actually a lot behind this, so they love to ask it. It's very popular in open-ended questions, and as you can see, tons of diagrammatic stuff. You don't need to do reams and reams of writing. How are we doing for time? That's pretty much my time up at that. Thanks for listening, folks. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.